Okay, so we will start now. Um, let me first present Peter. Um, Peter, well, I'm a PhD student at Pablo's group, at Pablo's account group, and I'm collaborating with Peter, who is from the DPU Energy Department, on, on a European project called WICMAP, which is meant to accelerate uh, battery discovery with artificial intelligence. And Peter, his background is his undergraduate studies were in uh, electrical engineering in IT. Then his master was also in engineering. And then he took an unexpected turn and started working on science, on molecule, molecules and this kind of stuff. In his PhD already, he worked on graph neural networks to predict molecular properties. And since then, now he's a postdoc. He's been a postdoc for four years at DPU. And he's published already many nice papers predicting atomic properties with uh, neural networks. And today, he will present his latest works, I think, on DPFT, which is a package to, to predict electronic densities. So the room is yours. We'll do like 40, a 40 minute presentation, and then we'll have time for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about the uh, fast electron density estimation of uh, molecules, liquids, and solids uh, using graph neural networks, and it's uh, worked together with uh, Arkea, uh, yeah, my colleague at uh, TGU. How do I? Oops. Yeah, so uh, Paul already mentioned this, that uh, my background is in electronics engineering and then I did a couple of years in industry working with uh, signal processing uh, before I went uh, back to Denmark and did my uh, PhD in machine learning uh, in the computer science department and now I'm in the energy department working on autonomous uh, materials discovery. Yes. And so I want to talk about uh, electron density prediction, but uh, first I would like to also uh, introduce you to uh, more general deep learning for molecules and materials and how we got to where we are uh, today in this field uh, with uh, special emphasis on the graph neural networks. And so yeah, in the, in the broader picture, in autonomous materials discovery, we often uh, work with this, we call the screening funnel. So we have a lot of uh, candidate molecules that we, and we want to find the best ones for some application. Um, and we will use some very cheap methods in the beginning to screen uh, out the, the bad uh, uh, candidates. And then we'll maybe, if we end up with a few good ones in the end, we could uh, validate them with uh, experiments. Um, yeah, so if we take uh, one slice of this funnel, it could be a DFT calculations that we run for hours uh, and days, uh, trying to screen through these uh, molecules. Um, and the idea with the uh, machine learning method here is then that once we have a big uh, database of candidates that we have screened through, then we can feed them into a machine learning algorithm that then can learn these uh, relations, the input-output relations, and uh, uh, yeah, this, this machine will be uh, much faster. It will run in uh, milliseconds instead of uh, hours, and, and hopefully also with uh, good accuracy. Um, yeah, so this is a, a depiction of a a neural network, so uh, yeah, we usually uh, they usually work with only uh, vector inputs. So we have some vector that we put in, and we have some uh, weights here on some parameters and all the connections, and we get some uh, scalar output in the end. Um, and yeah, this was uh, when this uh, started becoming a big thing. Uh, people started thinking, okay. I want to uh, put my uh, molecule into this uh, uh, algorithm, but uh, the problem is that uh, 
this is not a vector, it's a set of uh, positions and atomic numbers. Uh, yeah, how, how can we how can we put that into our graph neural networks? And so then uh, people started coming up with a different representation of molecules in, in vector formats. And the important thing is that uh, it should be uh, invariant to rotation and translations, meaning that uh, yeah, for example, if you try to predict an energy, if the molecule is here or if it's up here, it should be yeah, the same energy. Um, and it also shouldn't matter which order we input the, the atom and positions in. That's what I mean with uh, invariant under relabeling. Um, and also, we don't want, we also have to make sure we don't throw away important information. Uh, yeah, for example, if we only uh, tell the the algorithm which bonds they have, so these two uh, molecules have the same bonds, but they are not the same. Okay, so um, yeah, ten, year, 10 years ago, this was a state of the art in, uh, in representing uh, molecules. So we used uh, something called the Coulomb matrix that uh, in the off diagonal terms, we had the Coulomb interaction, the force between the, between the atoms, and then at the diagonal, you just have the atomic numbers with these uh, factors on. And, and it's a uh, rotation and translation invariant because uh, we use just the relative distance between the atoms uh, and not the absolute positions. Uh, but the problem here is that it's the, the order of the rows and columns is uh, arbitrary, so it's not uh, invariant under the relabeling. Uh, but it does keep all the important information because you can actually go from this representation back to the coordinates and atomic numbers. So you don't throw any information away when you. Uh, yeah. Why is this strange uh, exponent to go for? Yeah, I'm actually not sure. Yeah, I don't, I, that's. A, I'm also. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, two point three would also work. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, then, to solve this uh, relabeling problem, uh, they proposed a different solution. One is to uh, yeah take the norm of all the rows and then sort uh, depending on that. Uh, but that's also not very nice solution because then small changes in the input will uh, cause dramatic changes in the in the representation uh, because you get this discontinuity when the two rows swap around. So another approach is to uh, try to summarize all the information about a molecule in a fixed uh, length vector, which would be uh, to use a histogram of the interatomic distances or some other kind of fingerprint. Uh, yeah, but this is a bit problematic because it's hard to choose which information to keep beforehand. And yeah, it's, you will lose some information doing this. Um, yeah, so the, the solution we're going to go with instead is uh, trying to um, simply give up on, uh, on modeling the representing the whole system at a time, but instead we will uh, localize the problem. And uh, for example, if we want to predict the energy, we write it as a, a sum of energies from, so we get an energy contribution from each uh, atom. And, and that, that was used in this Bila uh, uh, Paranello network. Which, Uh, which looks like this, and then, um, yeah. So you have some uh, input coordinates of all your atoms, and then you uh, have they have handcrafted some uh, so-called symmetry functions that will describe the atomic environment around each uh, around each atom, and and this gives you one vector for each atom that you then can put through your uh, the neural network and get an energy contribution for each of them that you then sum over. Let's close. On can you, yeah. 
Okay. So the more questions. Yes. For me, it's saying that you have now it's, uh, it's like for one atom. Yeah. You also include information about the species of the atom. Yes. Yeah. So that is also called to be effective. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, but then, then the next uh, innovation was to, instead of trying to specify these uh, um, symmetry function by hand, uh, we would instead try to uh, learn a representation of the uh, atomic environment. And that is where these so-called graph neural networks come in. So now we initialize every uh, node in a graph corresponding to each uh, atom uh, and it's initialized with the atomic number um, and then uh, yeah these these uh, nodes in a graph will then uh, interact with each other and you will get a final state which is then uh, uh, mapped into an energy in the same way as before um, And there's another advantage of doing it uh, like this, uh, because uh, to make something local, we need to have some uh, cutoff distance, which means, uh, yeah, we cannot see for this atom, we will not look into a neighborhood that is bigger than, than this. But when you do it in an uh, iterative uh, way, you will, yeah, so this atom will talk to this atom, but this atom has already talked to an atom over here, so you get a much larger uh, effective cutoff, which uh, is what we refer to as the receptive field. And uh, yeah, it's the same. It's it's like a, a, the same in image processing that you have uh, one pixel that is influenced by the by the whole image by using uh, several layers of uh, smaller Evolutions. So, to uh, build a graph neural network, um, uh, yeah, it can it can be uh, written just by these uh, two equations here. Um, again, we have our graph and. Each node in a graph corresponds to an atom, and uh, they have some initial state that is depending on the atomic species. Um, for each uh, atom, then we calculate uh, messages from all the surrounding atoms using this uh, yeah, message function M. Um, and this uh, atom then receives uh, messages, uh, a sum of messages from all the neighbors. And uh, using this sum and its own state, then it will update update its uh, own state. Um, so all we need to do is to uh, define this uh, message function and the state transition function. And uh, yeah, in one of the most popular graph neural networks is this uh, SNP model. Yeah, the, the two functions look like this. Uh, and there's a lot of other uh, models that fit into this uh, simple uh, framework. Uh, yeah, so this is basically two layer uh, neural networks with some weight matrices and some uh, nonlinearities. But yeah, there's a lot of uh, design freedoms there. And yeah, you can uh, go even uh, more crazy and also try to uh, not only update the node states, but also update the uh, edge states. Uh, and that was uh, something uh, I had uh, success with uh, previously, especially if we have a data set with many different uh, species, it seems to be uh, effective to also uh, uh, update the, 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 the edges. And yeah. So I tested this on uh, three different uh, data sets. So Q9 is small uh, molecules, uh, small organic molecules. And these two are big uh, open uh, materials uh, databases. 
and uh, yeah, this this is I think a quite a nice improvement uh, on that. Um, yeah. But then uh, people realize that uh, it seems uh, that these models that we have developed are not actually very good at uh, uh, understanding long range interactions, even though that uh, it should be able to with these uh, multiple uh, iterations. Um, and it comes down to the problem that that the, the state of each uh, node, they have no uh, notion of direction. So once you get a message from uh, from someone, you you have already forgotten where it came from. Um, so the the next uh, uh, big improvement in these models was to uh, try to have some uh, directional information in the in the nodes, and that's yeah has been. The last three, four years, uh, people have uh, developed models in this direction. So now, instead of only ha having some, uh, we, before we just had an array of scalars for each uh, node in a graph, but now we also have some uh, vector inside the inside the nodes, and they will send these uh, vectors between each other, um, and then we can keep some uh, notion of, uh, of directionality. Um, yeah, so the example up here is from the equivalent message passing uh, paper uh, that you have two uh, rings uh, on top of each other and the, the cutoff distance is so small that they can only see this atom in the middle. Um, but if you, and if you don't use uh, the equivalent model, then the energy will just be, be flat with the, the blue and the, and the black line here. With the, with the angle when you rotate, but if, but if you use a equivalent mesh passing, then it will be able to resolve this angle. Uh, so this is a, a, a paper from two years ago that the Lilienfeld has uh, summarized. Yeah, all the different, uh, uh, not all of them, but some of the, the models that are out there. Uh, so when we evaluate models, we often uh, plot them in this uh, log log uh, plot with the number of training examples uh, on the x-axis and the uh, error on the test set on the y-axis. And, and if everything works correctly, this should usually be a straight line uh, and you want to be as close uh, as you can in this direction. Um, yeah. So we started uh, 10 years ago with the Coulomb matrix, which is the one up here. And it had an uh, error on this benchmark data set of yeah, 150 milli EV. Um, then we saw the this net model is is down here, which was data the out two years ago, uh, and yeah. Then now I, I have added the this whole family of equivalent networks, and they are they're down here, and they are they are maybe only a couple of years old. So hopefully we'll get even further down. <laughs> And but there is uh, one problem is that uh, okay we look we have these great models and then we try to use them for example to uh, run molecular dynamics um, but sooner or later they will just uh, explode like we get very unrealistic uh, uh, forces uh, and this is uh, yeah it's kind of well known for people that are that are using the uh, trying to use these models and often the solution is just to uh, uh, add more data whenever, whenever it goes wrong and, and the phenomenon phenomenon was also described in the, this paper here where they took uh, yeah a number of the most promising models in literature and run molecular dynamics and 
none of them were actually stable uh, in, in all cases. So why is it I don't force this level to It's because uh, they mean that uh, force accuracy is not enough. Like they get very low error on the on the force uh, on the training set, and that's what I mean. And then, and then is the training set which is what the larger. It's not the force of itself. It's a, but the, I mean, if you have forces for sufficiently large data bits, yes, it should. Then it's okay. Yeah, it should. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I think they're trying to uh, make. Make a catchy title, but it's not very. <laughs> it's not the most descriptive, but uh, it maybe it made me put it up here because it's, uh, it's a catchy title. Um. Yeah. So uh, to summarize, we have these uh, great uh, experiment uh, networks for learning representation of chemical environments, uh, but uh, even though we get high accuracy, it might not uh, actually be good for running the. Uh, uh, in these simulations. Um, so that is uh, uh, yeah. one part of the motivation of uh, looking at the uh, uh, electron density prediction because uh, we think that, uh, first of all, the, we think that the electron density uh, contains a lot more information than just the energy. Uh, yeah, so the hypothesis is that the models that they have learned some uh, unrealistic relation between the atomic positions and the and the energy, but uh, for every simulation here, we have a lot more uh, uh, data about the about the density. Yeah, so we would like to to uh, build a model that uh, can then predict the electron density. Um, yeah, so again, the problem is that given, uh, given atomic positions and uh, the atomic species, then predict the electron density uh, around it. And, and again, it should be uh, equivalent to translation and rotation, meaning that if I rotate it, the density should uh, follow. Um, and we also want the model to be independent of the, of the width, uh, spacing, and the simulation box size. Uh, for example, uh, early attempts in this field, they would use uh, like uh, image convolution networks, but they don't work when you start. Uh, uh, yeah, they work on a on a specific uh, grid. And then, uh, yeah, fast. Uh, uh, the model should also be faster than the GFT, otherwise it's a little bit uh, useless. And. Um, so we use our graph neural network uh, to solve this uh, problem. And the main difference from before is that now we have introduced a, a special kind of node, and they are these uh, probe nodes. And what is special about those is that they they only receive messages, so they don't interact with the with the, with the rest of the graph. They will only uh, yeah, so you can place as many as you want, and uh, the representation of these uh, atom uh, nodes, they, they will not be affected. Um, but uh, yeah, we can, we can sort of query the density at uh, any point in space with these uh, probes. Um, and we uh, tested two different uh, variants of uh, the model, so uh, one of them was based on this uh, invariant uh, message passing features, so we only had the distance as on the on the edge. Um, and in the other equivariant model, we also have directional information on the edges and in the node states. But uh, except for that, the, the the procedure is the same. That you calculate these messages in some uh, iterations, and then uh, at the end you will. Yeah, map the state of each uh, probe to uh, some uh, scalar value that is the uh, electron density at that point in space. Um, 
So we tried it on the, these uh, three different data sets. So we have Q9, again, it's uh, small molecules, so a data set of uh, 130,000. Then we have this uh, uh, nickel manganese cobalt, uh, which is a material used in batteries. Uh, and the ethylene carbonate is also, uh, so this is an MD simulation. This is a, these are all equilibrium uh, structures. Um, yeah, and when we train this, uh, because these are very big, so we cannot uh, uh, train on the, uh, on the whole density every time. So instead we will sample only two molecules from our training set and then put uh, randomly uh, put a thousand of these uh, probes in space and calculate the mean squared error of these uh, probes and uh, yeah, use that to, to train the model with the gradient descent. Um, and to, to uh, assess how good it works, um, we use this uh, error metric, which is the estimated density uh, minus the reference density. So it's the, mean, the absolute error uh, integrated over the whole space uh, divided by the number of uh, electrons in the, in the reference. So, um, yeah, as a, as a baseline, we can look at the, the, the error that you get uh, from, uh, from VASP. Uh, like the difference between the, the yeah, so VASP uses, for initialization, uses the, the pro-atomic uh, densities as a globalization of those. Um, and that will give you an error around these, uh, yeah, around 10% most of the time. Um, yeah, and both the uh, invariant and the equivariant uh, deep GFC on all data sets gives a much smaller error. And especially on this ethylene uh, carbonate data set, it helped a lot to have this uh, equivariant uh, representation inside the, inside the graph. Um, so when we look at the data set, we don't have a special result if we agree to our data they are in a grid. They're in a grid. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this is how the error ISO services uh, look like. And um, this is if you use the, uh, the baseline, which was this uh, pro atomic uh, densities. And for the invariant model, we have some uh, error around the oxygens. It's actually the same for the equivalent model, but the errors are just a lot smaller. Yeah, we can also see that the, the errors, they look a little bit uh, noisy. And so we yeah, we, we also thought about coming up with a better baseline because this, we thought this one was uh, maybe uh, too easy to, to beat. So we looked at uh, if you use different exchange correlation functionals, how big are the difference between the, the densities. And so we, we took uh, the Q9 test set and recalculate them with eight different uh, functionals that are commonly, commonly used. Um, and then that gave us like a, a, a mean absolute deviation around each point. And we then integrate this over the um, yeah, over space like we, like we did with the, with the error metric. And then in, the, in that case, most of the you could say the disagreement between densities is around uh, well, the disagreement between different functionals is around this uh, 0.5 and 0.8 percent. Uh, so that is that is actually higher than the 
the usual error we get from the, the, the DGFT model. Um, but we also noticed that uh, yeah, the model also gave us some very uh, high errors, uh, out outliers. And they typically look like this. So if we have a high error outlier, it could be a molecule that looks like uh, this with some uh, very uh, tight angles. Uh, or, or it will be one of these ones, which is like an isolated uh, group. And yeah, that should be easy, but there are not that many of them in the, in the training set. So the, uh, the easiest molecules to predict uh, for the model is these uh, more uh, yeah, stretched out molecules. And uh, especially this uh, carbon hydrogen one is the, was the easiest one to predict. And yeah, but even the one percent is still uh, much better than the than the bad baseline. And and uh, yeah, what? so the runtime, uh, how fast is it? Uh, so this is uh, this uh, NMC uh, cathode material. Uh, we just uh, keep repeating uh, the, yeah, the the unit cell until uh, GFT. Uh, takes too long to complete. So this is the number of atoms on a log scale and the time. And this is a cubic scaling and this is a linear scaling. Um, yeah, and we can do uh, 20,000 20, atoms in uh, 10, 20 minutes. And yeah, with DFT we can do maybe 100, 200 maybe. And there's still a, a lot of room for improvement. This was only run on the one GPU and uh, yeah, it could be paralyzed uh, further. Um, yeah, so uh, usually people ask, uh, so what about the energy errors? Uh, because this uh, density error maybe doesn't mean so much. So what we tried to do was uh, uh, take the predictions from the model and then then feed it into uh, VASP again and ask it to do a non self consistent energy calculation. So keeping the density fixed. Um, and uh, yeah, we get, we get errors that are usually around this uh, 10 to the minus 4 EV per atom. Uh, but again, we have some, some big uh, outliers. So, so I made this histogram also in a log scale, otherwise it would just look like everything is uh, here, 10 to the minus 4. But uh, yeah, when we, when we do it do it like this, we can also see that yeah, there are some, some outlines with high energy errors. So um, if you want to use this, you will also need to figure out a way of detecting when this uh, happens. So in conclusion, what we, what we can do is we can get uh, pretty accurate density predictions from a model that is fully data driven. So what I mean by that is that we have uh, disregarded all the work that people have done in uh, basis functions and stuff like this. Uh, we have only uh, provided the, the, the data directly, sort of a, a brute force way of solving this problem. Um, and we get uh, much faster than DFT and it's a uh, linear scaling with the system size. And, and because we use this very general approach, it's not only a uh, tailored for electron density, so you can use it for any uh, volumetric property. And because the model is uh, fully differentiable, you can also get uh, gradient based properties. He will use that, for example, to characterize different bond types. Uh, and because we use this uh, equivalent internal representation, uh, it can also be 
easily extended to uh, yeah, multiple uh, outputs, but also vector uh, fields. Uh, yeah, so some of the limitations is that uh, it requires some amount of training data and also some amount of training time. It take a modernization took around uh, one week to train. And yeah, right now we don't get energies or other wave function drive DFT countries uh, for free. That is also something uh, we'd be interested in to find out how we can do that. Yes, so uh, that's uh, all from mm -hmm. me. Thank you so much for your presentation. So we can go now to questions if someone has something to ask for here. Yeah, so um, for this last part of fitting the or uh, predicting the densities, so to, to fit it, the learning curve is a uh, is a fixed set of coordinates. So we have these three sets, this uh, here the line or whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, so for each of these, we have fixed coordinates. Or, or, that, or do you change the, the position of the other to make the the learning? Uh. So what do you mean by fixed coordinates? So the um, so the Q nine is one hundred thirty thousand uh, different molecules in equilibrium state, and uh, uh, the other ones were specific crystals or systems. Yes, yeah, so the these were completely different to me. One for database and a particular crystal. Yes, yeah, so uh, okay. I don't mix. I don't mix these uh, three data. So we have uh, separate models for each of these uh, data sets. So for the first one, you include many molecules with different distances, so it's very comprehensive. Yes. The second and the third one, it gives a specific crystals with specific coordinates or whatever. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, some crystals with uh, different, uh, uh, so some of so, um, Yeah, so you, you take out, you make some vacancies and then optimize the structures. So it's a. Uh, um, there we have. 2,000 uh, different structures. So we have some prototype structure and we take out some uh, and make some vacancies. Yeah. And this one is a molecular dynamic simulation at very, very high temperature. Yeah. So, how, what, what kind of species are there in the field So, so it's a, a CNOF and hydrogen. So, um, so, okay, so for each problem that you want to handle, you have to do a training set. Yeah. You want to do the DFT. Yeah. The DFT has a limitation of size, no? Super cell, but you know, but there is a limit of size. Yeah. And then, can you train your thing with a lot of activations? And then, the idea is that once you have that model, you can actually go to systems that are far, far larger exactly. than the training that you could do. Yeah. So that yeah. Then there is where you gain. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, one thing we're seeing the other day after, after the Zoom meeting before is that uh, if, you get, if you have a density, an estimate of the density, then to compute the properties like the energy and so on. You will need to solve the full take DFT uh, structure with the organization, which is cute, but you can use some kind of further method. You put the density, then you can get the estimates of the energy for the line in a scaling electronic structure method without having to solve the wave functions. Yeah. That could be a nice application for this. I don't yes. know what's, what's, so you put sure that the linear slope. Yeah. But the pre-factor, I don't know how, how, how large is that compared to the in a scaling solution of the electric structure. No. Yeah. It may not be so different. If you can put the, the yeah, I mean, the it, graph again. Yeah, that one. So, so the crossover between fluid scaling and linear scaling is about uh, what? Uh, 30, 40 at the top. Yeah, down here. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it, it's probably one or two orders of magnitude uh, faster than, than the electronic structure solution with linear scaling. Because with linear scaling, you have the same, uh, the same uh, linear scaling, but you have a factor which is much larger. Yeah. The crossover is, is a much larger number of factors. So it will still be a significant part of the value. Yeah. The machine, machine learning calculation of the density will be still much faster than the linear scaling solution of the energy. Yeah. Okay. But I think it would, it would speed up quite a lot in the calculation because we would, we would skip this the consistent cycle. Yes, yeah. have an initial density that you assume it's uh, more or less correct. Yes. And you just need one calculation of the of the energy. Yeah, that's also what we want to try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.
probably these models that should yeah. be very bad at predicting complex And as you add you add some some global properties to the system with the box to be bad. Right? Like yeah. You're not restricted to use only local properties. Yeah. It's hard to say what what is the best thing to add. If they have long range, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can conclude here. Yeah. So thank you all for attending and thanks Peter for presenting. Yeah, so thank you. Give an applause to Peter.